Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to this service, and it's great to welcome a number of visitors here, and also to welcome those who uh, may be watching this service online. Uh, great to have you here in whatever form. Now, we are trying to encourage people to maintain distance. Um, I can see we've got a few that are a bit squashed up here, but uh, we, we uh, want to try and encourage that as much as possible. So please do be sensible with that. Be aware that the service is being recorded and live streamed. We had a little bit of trouble earlier on, and I'm hoping this is all going correctly. I arrived here this morning to discover that the internet was completely off. It just came on in time, and then someone told me later that they'd had a message from Tel Telstra earlier in the week saying it was going to be off until 8 o'clock. It didn't come on until about quarter past, so uh, it uh, caused me a few anxious moments this morning. But we've also got a little bit of a problem with the radio microphone when we get over to the font later. I apologise in advance if the sound becomes patchy. There's a very large brick wall between where the font is and where the radio receiver is and that's what causes the problem. I'll say some more things a little later in the service uh, by way of instruction, but uh, everything that you need is on the printed order of service. So I'm going to ask everyone to stand and uh, we will begin our time. The Lord be with you. And also with you. By grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God. There is one body and one spirit. There is one God hope in God's, in God's call, call to us. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. One, one God, God and Father of all. all. Please be seated. Baptism is the gift of our Lord Jesus Christ. When he had risen from the dead, he commanded his followers to go and make disciples of all nations, baptising them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. We have come together today to obey that command. Baptism with water signifies the cleansing from sin that Jesus' death makes possible and the new life that God gives us through the Holy Spirit. In baptism, the promises of God are visibly signed and sealed for us. We are joined to Christ and made members of his body, the Church Universal. So, we welcome you, uh, Emerson and Harrison, with your sponsors and families. We give thanks for you and pray that you may know God's love and faithfulness forever. As we begin, let us affirm our trust in God's mercy and confess our need of forgiveness. Merciful God, our maker and our judge, we have sinned against you in thought, word and deed, and in what we have failed to do. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbours as ourselves. We repent and are sorry for all our sins. Father, forgive us. 
Strengthen us to love and obey you in newness of life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, who has promised forgiveness to all who turn to him in faith, pardon you and set you free from all your sins, strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in eternal life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray. Loving and righteous God, your boundless generosity exceeds all that we can desire or deserve. And you give to the last worker all you promised to the first. Liberate us from all jealousy and greed, that we may be free to love and serve others, that in your service may find our true reward. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. A reading from the book of Exodus. In the desert, the whole community grumbled against Moses and Aaron. The Israelites said to him, if only we had died by the Lord's hand in Egypt. There we sat round pots of meat and ate all the food we wanted. But you have brought us out into this desert to starve this entire assembly to death. Then the Lord said to Moses, I will rain down bread from heaven for you. The people are to go out each day and gather enough for that day. In this way, I will test them and see whether they will follow my instructions. On the sixth day, they are to prepare what they bring in, and that is to be twice as much as they gather on the other days. So Moses and Aaron said to all the Israelites, In the evening you will know that it was the Lord who brought you out of Egypt, and in the morning you will see the glory of the Lord because he has heard your grumbling against him. Who are we that you should grumble against us? Moses also said. You will know that it was the Lord when he gives you meat to eat in the evening and all the bread you want in the morning, because he has heard your grumbling against him. Who are we? You are not grumbling against us, but against the Lord. Then Moses told Aaron, say to the entire Israelite community, Come before the Lord, he has heard your grumbling. While Aaron was speaking to the whole Israelite community, they looked towards the desert, and there was the glory of the Lord appearing in the cloud. The Lord said to Moses, I have heard the grumbling of the Israelites. Tell them, at twilight you will eat meat, and in the morning you will be filled with bread, and you will know that I am the Lord your God. That evening, quail came and covered the camp, and in the morning there was a layer of dew around the camp. When the dew was gone, thin flakes like frost on the ground appeared on the desert floor. When the Israelites saw it, they said to each other, What is it? For they did not know what it was. Moses said to them, It is the bread the Lord has given you to eat. Hear the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Psalm 105, verses 1 to 6 and 37 to 45. O oh, give thanks to the Lord and call upon his name. Tell among the peoples what things he has done. Sing to him, O oh, sing praises. And be telling of all his marvellous works. Exult in his holy name. And let those that seek the Lord be joyful in heart. Seek the Lord and his strength. O oh, seek his face continually. Call to mind what wonders he has done. His marvellous acts and the judgments of his mouth. O oh, seed of Abraham, his servant. O oh, children of Jacob, his chosen one. He brought Israel out with silver and with gold. And not one among their tribes was seen to stumble. Egypt was glad at their going. For dread of Israel had fallen upon them. He spread out a cloud for a covering. And fire to lighten the night. 
The people asked, and he brought them quails. And satisfied them with the bread from heaven. He opened a rock so that the waters gushed. And ran in the parched land like a river. For he had remembered his holy word. That he gave to Abraham his servant. So he led out his people with rejoicing. His chosen ones with shouts of joy. He gave them the land of the nations. And they took possession of the fruit for which other peoples had toiled. So that they might keep his statutes. And faithfully obey his laws. Oh, praise the Lord. A reading from the letter of Paul to the Philippians. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I am going to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet what shall I choose? I do not know. I am torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far. But it is more necessary for you that I remain in the body. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and I will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith, so that through my being with you again, your boasting in Christ Jesus will abound on account of me. Whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then, whether I come to see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in the one spirit striving together as one for faith in the gospel, without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you. This is a sign to them that they will be destroyed, but that you will be saved, and that by God. For it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, but all to suffer for him since you are going through the same struggle you saw I had and now hear that I still have. Hear the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew chapter 20 beginning at verse 1. Glory to you, Lord Jesus Christ. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire workers for his vineyard. He agreed to pay them a denarius for the day and sent them to his vineyard. About nine in the morning, he went out and saw others standing in the marketplace doing nothing. He told them, you also go and work in my vineyard and I will, I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. He went out again about noon and about three in the afternoon and did the same thing. About five in the afternoon, he, he went out and found still others standing around. He asked them, why have you been standing here all day long doing nothing? Because no one has hired us, they answered. He said to them, you also go and work in my vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, call the workers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last ones hired and going on to the first. The workers who were hired about five in the afternoon came and received a denarius. So when those who came were hired first, they expected to receive more. But each one of them also received a denarius. When they received it, they began to grumble against the landowner. These who were hired last worked only one hour, they said. 
and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the work and the heat of the day. But he answered to one of them, I am not being unfair to you, friend. Didn't you agree to work for a denarius? Take your pay and go. I want to give the one who was hired last the same as I gave you. Don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money? Or are you envious because I am generous? So the last will be first, and the first will be last. For the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Please be seated. I heard a story about a farmer whose name was Oli. Oli retired from farming and moved into town where he discovered that he was the only Protestant in his new town and the rest were all Catholics. Now that in itself was fine but it created a problem for his new neighbours because Oli liked to cook barbecued steak every Friday, whereas they'd all been brought up with the rule that you can't eat red meat on Fridays. And the smell of the barbecue was driving them crazy. So they went to have a chat with Oli about it all. And they said to him, look, Oli, you're the only Lutheran in this town. He happened to be Lutheran. And uh, there's no Lutheran church for miles. So uh, we'd like you to join our church and become a Catholic. They, of course, hoping that by becoming a Catholic, he'd have to give up eating steak on Fridays. Clever plan. Well, Oli said, yes, I'm happy to join your church. And he went to make arrangements with the priest. So the priest organised a ceremony where he got Oli to kneel he put his hand on Oli's head and he said, Oli, you were born a Lutheran. You were raised a Lutheran. But now, as he sprinkled some incense over Oli's head, he said, now you are a Catholic. They were all very pleased with this outcome and thought the problem was solved. That is, until Friday night came around when once again the aroma of barbecuing beef came wafting from Oli's yard. So his neighbours immediately went round to see what was going on. And as they got close to the fence, they heard Oli speaking to the steak on his barbecue. And he was saying something which sounded strangely familiar. You were born a beef, you were raised a beef, and as he sprinkled over, uh, salt over the meat, he said, and now you are a fish. <laughs> okay, so that's possibly not a true story. <laughs> but I'm sure we can all see at once how ludicrous it is to suggest that some sort of quasi-religious ceremony, however elaborate, can turn beef into fish. So what about baptism? We're here this morning to take part in a ceremony. What do we think it's going to do? Will what we do here this morning be any more beneficial to the children being baptised than an attempt to declare beef to be fish? I don't suppose it will surprise you to hear me say that what we're doing is important and has great value. Because even though from one point of view baptisms are symbolic or representative action, it represents something real, something very significant. And that is faith in Jesus Christ. 
it expresses that faith. For those who are baptised, it expresses placing their futures in his hands and making a commitment to follow him for the rest of their lives. Now that, of course, is a big thing. So I want to say a little bit about it. And to begin with something the Apostle Paul referred to in his letter to the Philippians, which we heard in our second Bible reading this morning. The Gospel of Christ. That expression's there a couple of times in verse 27. And the word translated gospel means some kind of important announcement. We commonly hear it described as the good news. The good news about Jesus. And I'm going to touch on three things about this good news. One from each of the Bible readings. First, that it's a rescue operation. Second, that it's a gift. And third, that it's a life-changing encounter. The first Bible reading this morning comes from the time of Moses. And it's just after God has miraculously rescued his people from slavery in Egypt, where they'd been oppressed and badly treated for hundreds of years. God told Moses... He had to go to Pharaoh, the ruler of Egypt, and tell him to let the people of Israel go. I have to say Moses wasn't all that keen on this plan because from a human point of view, it looked hopeless, crazy, even positively suicidal. But God told him, don't worry, I will make it happen. And he did with a series of plagues and a miraculous parting of the Red Sea so that the Israelites could cross safely on dry land. That's what we read about last Sunday. And today we've read the next part of the story where God miraculously feeds them in the desert. But however you look at it, this is a dramatic rescue operation. Just this week, a man was rescued after falling while bushwalking near Hobart. You might have seen it on the news. Uh, The rescuers decided it was going to be too rough a ride to carry him out, so they called in the helicopter and winched him up. Fortunately, they said the weather was perfect and it all went very smoothly. But, you know, the presence of a rescue team presupposes that there's a problem. We never find ourselves doing something quite ordinary, uh, walking around the supermarket, for example, to be confronted by a uniform crew who say, we're here to rescue you. The helicopter doesn't turn up just when you're having a pleasant walk in the park. These things only happen when you need rescuing, as the people of Israel did in Egypt. God sent his son Jesus into the world because we had a problem and needed rescuing. The strange thing is that lots of the time the problem isn't obvious. Most days seem good. But then there's an accident, a crime, an illness, something to remind us that all is not right with the world. Those things are just symptoms of a deeper problem and the Bible gives this problem the name sin. Essentially, sin is pushing God out of the picture and insisting on running our own lives our own way. Sin gets a mention shortly in our service when the parents and godparents, on behalf of the children being baptised, promise to repent or turn away from their sins. That is, being baptised involves recognising that sin is indeed a problem. Though it's not overcome simply by trying hard to be good. I'm guessing we've all worked out that trying hard never quite gets you to where you want to be. Now the Bible says that Jesus paid for our sins when he died on the cross for us. And that's a key part of this good news about Jesus. That it's a rescue operation. One that succeeded and gets us out of a real problem. But that leaves a question. 
Jesus giving his life for us might be a successful rescue operation, but how does it connect with me? What do I have to do to be included? For example, could it be something like the travel voucher scheme the other day where you have to get in quick or you miss out? Is there only limited space? Does it cost something? In the reading from Matthew's Gospel, which we had a moment ago, we heard one of the parables Jesus told. These are stories intended to make us think. And one of the keys to understanding them is not to get too hung up about the details. Because in one sense, this is a bizarre story. Who do what this landowner did? Who'd think it was fair to pay all the workers the same when some had obviously worked far harder and longer than others? Well, one thing I can tell you is that it's not intended as a textbook case on industrial relations. And in fact, the whole point of it is that it is unfair. That is, it's unfair if your underlying assumption is that everything in life has to be about getting what you deserve. Notice that in some way it's meant to tell us about the kingdom of heaven. Jesus begins by saying the kingdom of heaven is like this story in some way. But he also says something very intriguing at the end. So the last will be first and the first will be last. It's, it's not exactly a conclusion to the story or even the moral of the tale, but it's meant to tell us something. Something about the way God deals with people. See, the way the world normally works in our experience is that the first are first and the last are last. When the football season ends, it'll be the first ones that play off in the finals, not the last. When exam results come out, it's the first ones who get the prizes, not the last. And that's because we all accept that those things should be a fair reward for effort. You try hard, you succeed, you get the prize at the end. What if God doesn't work that way? What if God deals with us in some way that's completely different to that? There's a point to this story and it's this. If you think God rewards us for good behaviour or for trying hard, then you've got it completely wrong. That may surprise you. Because I find that people commonly think that if you're good, you go to heaven. And if you're bad, well, you end up in very big trouble. But Jesus says that being right with God is not like earning a reward or being paid for your effort. But instead, it's like receiving a gift. A couple of times over the years, we've been given quite generous gifts completely unexpected and for no apparent reason. It wasn't Christmas or birthday or... It was just the generosity of the person who gave it. And all you can do is receive it. Say thank you. You can't think, I've somehow earned this. This is right and due to me. You can only express gratitude. Oh, sure, I suppose you can... Reject it. You can throw it back at the person who's given it to you if you want. But that doesn't change the fact that it's not a reward for effort. Part of this good news about Jesus, which underlies what baptism is, is that being right with God can't be earned by good living, but that God gives it to us as a gift. Now, don't get me wrong, I am not against good behaviour. In fact, I'm all for it. And those who've received God's gift will, by and large, want to try and live in a way that pleases God. But that good living comes as a response to the gift. It's an expression of gratitude, not the means by which we earn God's favour. Now, the third observation that I want to make is that this good news about Jesus involves a life-changing encounter. The Apostle Paul himself, of course, had a very dramatic change when he was struck blind on the road to Damascus by a vision of the risen Lord Jesus. But we're talking here about something more than a 
one-off occasion. You get a hint of it in the first words of our reading from his letter to the Philippians. For me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. Yes, he undoubtedly believed in heaven, something better to come after he died. But in the here and now, he says, to live is Christ. By which, is mean, by which he means that his life had been so radically changed by his encounter with Jesus that it shaped every aspect of it from then on. He urges the believers in Philippi to conduct themselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. It's the same as I was saying a moment ago about living in response to God's gift, living in a way that expresses our gratitude to God, a way that's pleasing to him. It's another thing that's going to be picked up shortly in the baptism service. When those being baptised, their parents and godparents speaking for them, promise that they will strive to live as a disciple of Christ, one of his followers, loving God with their whole heart and loving their neighbour as themselves. One of the things I always try to explain to parents as we speak about baptism is that there's no point seeing this event today as complete in itself. Get it done, then relax and forget about it afterwards. It only makes sense as the start of a lifetime commitment, following Jesus from here on. When our baptism service was put together, centuries ago now, even though the language has since been updated a little, part of the thinking behind it was that it's not only about the children being baptised but an occasion for all of us. For those of us who've been baptised, to remember the promises that were made. And for those of us who may never have given it much thought at all, to consider the gospel of Christ, this good news that is a rescue operation, a gift and a life-changing encounter. I hope you will do that and that these are things we'll all take a moment to reflect on and if necessary to do something about. Well, we uh, now come to the part of the service where we're going to share in the, uh, the baptisms. And uh, so we follow the uh, printed order uh, again. Children are baptised in response to God's all-embracing love. Parents and godparents who have responded to that love come now to bring their children for baptism. Before this congregation, they must express their own trust and commitment to the promises of God and their intention to bring up their children in the faith and practice of the church. In due time, these children should make their own response to God and be prepared for confirmation. Now, I'm going to ask the parents and godparents to stand just where they are for the moment and to uh, answer some questions. And the good thing for you is that the answers are printed for you, so you don't have to even think too hard about it. But uh, you might like to say them nice and loudly so that the people watching online can hear. Will you accept the responsibilities placed upon you in bringing this child for baptism? Are you willing to answer on behalf of this child? By your own prayers and example, by your friendship and love, will you encourage this child in the life and faith of the Christian community? Now, this uh, next part is perhaps a little 
hard for us to get our heads around, but we've got to imagine this is the children themselves speaking, but because they're too small to do that, their parents and godparents are speaking the words on their behalf. Before God and this congregation, you must affirm that you turn to Christ and reject all that is evil. Do you turn to Christ? Do you repent of your sins? Do you reject selfish living and all that is false and unjust? Do you renounce Satan and all evil? Almighty God, deliver you from the powers of darkness and lead you in the light of Christ to his everlasting kingdom. Amen. I'm now going to invite the congregation to stand and let us together affirm the faith of the church. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Now the congregation can be seated again, and just the parents and godparents stay standing. Do you affirm this faith as yours? Will you each, by God's grace, strive to live as a disciple of Christ, loving God with your whole heart and your neighbour as yourself, until your life's end? And now this is a question to the congregation. You have heard, that because it's two boys, it's, well, say, we have heard these, our brothers, respond to Christ. Will you support them in this calling? Colin's now going to lead us in some prayers. Let us pray. Grant, merciful God, that these persons may be so buried with Christ in baptism that the new nature may be raised up in them. May the fruit of your spirit grow and flourish in them. God of grace, hear our prayer. Give to their sponsors and their families the desire to share with them what is, have, you have revealed in your holy gospel. God of grace, hear our prayer. May they know Christ's forgiving love and continue in the fellowship and service of his church. May they proclaim by word and example the good news of God in Christ. God of grace, hear our prayer. We pray for the world in which we live, for peace and harmony among all people, bringing healing and wholeness to the sick, to those who mourn, and to all in need. God of grace, hear our prayer. We thank you for the ministry which we, we have in your world and each other in the household of faith. Hasten that day when the whole creation shall be made perfect in Christ. God of grace, hear our prayer.
My apologies to those watching at home. I don't think this microphone was actually on then, and so you won't have heard some of the sound, uh, and uh, I'm sorry about that. I'm just going to take this moment to make a couple of announcements before we proceed. Uh, for those who would like to participate in Holy Communion in a moment, uh, we're going to ask you to come up on the right-hand side to use the hand sanitizer, but to spread out. So we don't want people bunched up uh, in a queue coming up. Uh, we, and uh, Gemma will help direct traffic uh, as uh, people come up. We can only have six at the rail at a time, and communion is distributed only in individual cups at the moment. Uh, so uh, I hope that that will uh, make sense when you uh, when you see it. Uh, if oh, sorry. Apologies, the people at home are seeing the font and just hearing my voice from a distance. Right. Too many things to juggle today, that's the problem. Uh, at the uh, conclusion of the service, uh, can I ask you to take the service sheets home with you and to dispose of them? Uh, and uh, we unfortunately we, we can't congregate inside, but uh, people often chat out in the um, outside. That's fine. And if we can have a couple of people volunteer just to help with some quick cleaning at the end, that will be a great help. Uh, on uh, Friday morning, there's some cleaning up being done at the Evandale Church. If anyone's free to volunteer for a short time at around nine o'clock, that would be helpful. I think that's all I need to, uh, to say. Uh, and uh, so we're going to proceed now. Oh, sorry, there, there's no offertory being passed around today, but there will be um, bags. Uh, Harry's got one and uh, Audrey, and they'll be standing in the aisle. You'll need to go to them because we're not passing it around at present. Shall we stand? In baptism, God has made us one in Christ. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Blessed are you, Lord, God of all creation. 
Through your goodness, we have these gifts to share. Accept and use our offerings for your glory and for the service of your kingdom. Blessed be God forever. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. All glory and honour be yours always and everywhere. Mighty Creator, ever-living God. We give you thanks and praise for your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ, who, by the power of your Spirit, was born of Mary and lived as one of us. By his death on the cross and rising to new life, he offered the one true sacrifice for sin and obtained an eternal deliverance for his people. In baptism, you have united us to him and brought us out of darkness into light. You pour your spirit upon us, filling us with your gifts and calling us to serve you as a royal priesthood. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we proclaim your great and glorious name, forever praising you and saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Merciful God, we thank you for these gifts of your creation, this bread and wine. And we pray that by your word and Holy Spirit, we who eat and drink them may be partakers of Christ's body and blood. On the night he was betrayed, Jesus took bread, and when he had given you thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup, and again giving thanks, he gave it to his disciples, saying, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, shed for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Therefore we do as our Saviour has commanded, proclaiming his offering of himself made once for all upon the cross his mighty resurrection and glorious ascension. And looking for his coming again, we celebrate with this bread and this cup, his one perfect and sufficient sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. Renew us by your Holy Spirit. Unite us in the body of your Son and bring us with all your people into the joy of your eternal kingdom. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, with whom and in whom in the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, we worship you, Father, in songs of never-ending praise. Blessing and honour and glory and power are yours forever and ever. Amen. As our Saviour Christ has taught us, we are confident to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. We who are many are one body for we all share in the one bread. Jesus, Lamb of God, have mercy on us. Jesus, bearer of our sins, have mercy on us. Jesus, redeemer of the world, grant us your peace. Come, let us take this holy sacrament of the body and blood of Christ in remembrance that he died for us and feed on him in our hearts by faith with thanksgiving.
Let us pray. Gracious God, in baptism you make us one family in Christ your Son, one in the sharing of his body and his blood, one in the communion of his spirit. Help us to grow in love for one another and come to the full maturity of the body of Christ. Father, we offer ourselves to you as a living sacrifice. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, send us out in the power of your spirit to live and work to your praise and glory. Go forth into the world in peace. Be of good courage. Hold fast that which is good. Render to no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted, support the weak, help the afflicted, give honour to all, love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. In the name of Christ. Amen. Now, in a moment, uh, we're going to have the opportunity to conclude with a hymn. We have been making the hymns optional because we understand that uh, the um, risk of infection is higher with singing. So if you would prefer not to stay for the hymn, you're most welcome to move outside now. Uh, but otherwise, the words of the hymn are on a separate sheet and we will stand and join in singing together.